Thank you for those thoughts and uh, challenging times ahead. Um, Commissioner Chopra, please. So uh, thank you all for having me. I also want to echo the thanks to uh, Lamore and the team for organizing this and other events and, and really being a foundation for connecting more of us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to meet with so many startups and my fellow government officials here in Israel, the amount we share. Uh, it is a good reminder to know the amount we share and how we have to confront big challenges together. Uh, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here in Israel, one of the world's most thriving centers of technology and entrepreneurship. Uh, I've already had the chance to meet so many companies, companies looking to make their mark globally. And many are excited about the future, but also very anxious about the challenges that people around the world are facing when it comes to technology, society, and the economy. If you think about it, it wasn't that long ago when most of what we would read and hear about technology was entirely how it could change our lives for the better, the endless possibilities and the potential of human achievement. New products and services were making us more connected, helping us save time, money, and do things we could not previously imagine. And the leaders of these companies were self-described disruptors, always looking to put users first. But I think now we read and hear a different set of stories, especially when it comes to dominant platforms. Those startups of years ago are now large and powerful corporations. In fact, seven of the top 10 largest corporations in the world by market capitalization are either an American or a Chinese technology firm. They are no longer small and scrappy, but they can use their considerable clout to impose rules and regulations over users, suppliers, small developers, and startups. And for many companies, examining the regulatory environment doesn't necessarily mean looking at laws. It now means looking at fine print imposed by technology firms. And on top of this, many of these firms are able to map our minds by harvesting massive amounts of data. Journalist Julia Angwin wrote how one of these firms could, quote, build a complete portrait of a user by name based on everything they write in email, every website they visit, and the searches they conduct. And more and more people are coming to the realization that the threats posed by online behavioral advertising models go well beyond privacy and involve a deeper set of issues that societies have to confront. So today I want to outline three threats and challenges posed by today's business practices in the tech sector. First is to fair economic competition. Second is to our civil rights. And third is to our democracy and the competition for ideas. So first, it's going to be important for us to investigate how technology platforms may be threatening economic competition. Turbocharging competition and innovation has always been a key promise of an increasingly digital world and an open internet. If you wanted to make or sell something, you wouldn't have to go through a lot of gatekeepers. And 20 years ago, we started to see online offerings truly take off and change commerce. But many of the earliest popular online offerings saw their fortunes dry up when a better competitor emerged. This is how it's supposed to work. That's what markets do. In a market without gatekeepers and barriers, best products and services should win out. So, Investors and entrepreneurs in some of those original online offerings who didn't take off over the long term, I think they, they knew 
that if they wanted to hit a very big payday, they were going to need to create an essential utility that just could not be shut down. This is something that has been replicated across economic history about how to make sure that a business cannot be unplugged. So what did they do? They would need to expand their reach horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. First by dominating functions, then leveraging those functions into market platforms, and then embedding those platforms across the internet in both software and devices. This strategy couldn't be executed solely through their own innovation. In many cases, it would rely on a Wall Street style acquisition strategy. So firms seeking dominance saw the value of a company not just in its standalone revenue, but in the ways that it would increase the company's scale, scope, and bargaining leverage when it comes to new data sources to harvest and to enter into new markets. Now, both in the US and in Europe and even in Israel, we would read about an acquisition with an eye-popping price. And analysts and commentators would ridicule the buyer for overpaying. But for many investors and corporate boards, they had a clear vision in mind. For example, more than a decade ago, Google bought a small two-year-old company with little revenue called YouTube for $1.65 billion, more than a billion dollars higher than the buyer's own internal valuation, according to some reporting. In 2012, Facebook bought Instagram for $1 billion when it had a whopping $0 in sales. In 2014, Facebook bought WhatsApp for $19 billion, which had around $20 million in sales the previous year. But what would the world look like if these acquisitions never happened? What if Google never bought Waze, founded here in Israel? Or perhaps put another way, what if MySpace or Friendster, the dominant social media platforms of years ago, was able to buy Facebook? No one will ever know what the world would look like today. But if we still believe in the promise of the digital economy, we need to ask ourselves whether certain business practices and merger activity are promoting innovation or simply allowing incumbents to hold on to their dominance. Second, we need to better understand how technology platforms can be a threat to civil rights and the goals of fairness we seek in our society. Large technology firms are carefully connecting the dots about each of our lives, creating detailed dossiers about all of us. And as Commissioner Dixon just referenced, this powers the model for online behavioral advertising or targeted advertising. And how these dossiers are used or misused is opaque and can be damaging. Massive data collection is feeding algorithms that are making more decisions about our society, like which college a student is admitted to or whether a prison inmate will get parole. Mathematical models now help determine not only whether we can get a job, get a loan, an apartment, or even whether we'll even see a listing online in the first place. In the United States, our civil rights and anti-discrimination laws have sought to keep certain elements out of the equation, whether it comes to credit, employment, housing, education, and more. We've put these laws into place with the goal of making our society more just and fair. And while machines crunching numbers might seem capable of taking human bias out of the equation, they can't. More and more of us are asking whether we are doing enough to understand that bias can be coded into the machines. And if not, are we making discrimination even harder to detect? Findings from academic studies and news reporting raise questions about algorithmic bias 
and its effect on civil rights and competition. One report showed that men were much more likely to be shown higher wage job listings than women, even with the same qualifications. Uh, according to this one news report, one company's recruiting algorithms seem to reinforce preferences toward hiring men, downgrading graduates of women's colleges, and even resumes that listed the word women, as in women's chess club captain. Scholars are shining a light on these prediction engines and raising important questions. How can we know the reason for a decision and who is responsible for those decisions? The reality is that we should never assume that algorithms will be free of bias. Instead, we need to own that reality and act. We understand that people have biases and we structure our laws and rights in all democratic societies accordingly. And we need to do the same here. If we still have an aspiration no matter what country li we live in, of a society where there is more equal opportunity, we need to understand whether these black box models, protected as trade secrets, are undermining that goal. And finally, we need to understand how the tech sector is reshaping democracy and the competition for ideas. Now, there has been considerable attention to how social media and behavioral advertising can be weaponized to sway elections and impact politics. Bots, fake accounts, disinformation, these are all now part of our vocabulary. And this is important, but it is not the only intersection between technology and democracy. Speech and debate are the lifeblood of a democratic society. And this is a particularly important to say in the most thriving democracy in this region. We need a competitive marketplace and real competition for diverse ideas and perspectives. Competition for ideas allows the best ones to emerge in ways that make a democracy and a society flourish. A competitive marketplace of ideas requires news and journalism and books and authors. This competition helps keep those in power accountable. Another promise of the digital marketplace was giving those with ideas a new vehicle to reach others, and that's certainly true. Bloggers and podcasters, they don't require a permission slip from someone in New York or London, and that's a good thing. While tech, with tech platforms serving as the gateway for Americans and citizens across the world to consume news and ideas, their dominance is raising fears about journalism and publishing. These firms don't really employ journalists, uh, they've, but they've had a dramatic impact. According to one calculation, in the United States, there are half as many journalists working in newsrooms today compared to 2008. For better or worse, news and journalism have long rested on a robust advertising market. And in recent years, advertising technology and behavioral targeting have reshaped advertising markets. The battle for advertising dollars is not waged on the basis of the quality or popularity of news content. It is increasingly driven by a contest on who has more data and who was the first to get it. Since the data hoarder, not the content creator, is capturing a bigger and bigger slice of the pie, there's less to go around to those with the ideas. For local news outlets that lack the bargaining leverage, their struggles mean less transparency and accountability at all levels of power. It's not just news and journalism, it's books too. A few weeks ago, a few months ago, the Authors Guild, which is a, a U.S. association, reported that median writing-related earnings by authors plummeted by 42% over the last decade. Now, even with the rise of e-books and self-publishing, which should theoretically allow authors to cut out intermediaries and earn more, authors are reporting that the new marketplace leaves them no choice but to accept lower and lower royalties at more restrictive terms. Many authors report that they're simply not getting their fair share. 
we will never know what damage this has done. What books will never be written, what ideas will never see the light of day. And moving forward, we need to ask ourselves what these developments mean for democratic societies like the United States and Israel. We need to make sure that technology is propelling democracy and not impeding it. No single individual or entity has a monopoly when it comes to investigating and safeguarding us from these challenges and threats. And all across the globe, policymakers and enforcers are asking more questions about how privacy and data collection connects with these broader questions of competition and democracy. The Federal Trade Commission in the United States has, we've held a series of hearings that included discussions on platforms, artificial intelligence, nascent competitors, serial acquisitions, and vertical mergers. We have also launched a new task force to increase our focus on enforcement against anti-competitive practices in this domain to determine, for example, whether algorithms are leading to coordinated pricing effects or how incumbent firms evaluate the acquisition of new startups. It's becoming increasingly clear that we need to reduce or eliminate conflicts of interest and exclusionary conduct, increase transparency, and advance structural reforms. So let me conclude by reminding all of us that over the last century, it was competition policy and enforcement that was a key contributor in creating the conditions for scores of startups to innovate and flourish. Many of the globe's most valuable companies would likely not exist, nor many of the startups in this nation, had governments not taken action against Microsoft 20 years ago. And while we often focus on the costs of action and regulation, we also need to ask ourselves about the cost of inaction and sitting by on the sidelines and whether we are missing out on innovation, new firms, and great progress that come with a competitive marketplace. So for nations across the globe that seek to harness the benefits of technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation, we must make sure that the tech economy promotes privacy and civil rights, competition, and our democratic ideals rather than hindering them. Thank you.